Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Great. Thank you very much for confirming that you can hear me. And a very good afternoon to you. My name is Bringi, and I'm part of the Center for Management Communication here at IIM Bangalore. I really appreciate all of you taking your time off to be with us for this afternoon's CENCOM Connect webinar, which is going to be uh, shared with you by Professor Ramya Ranganathan. Lots of thanks to you, Ramya, for sparing your Friday afternoon to be with us and to talk about the role of communication, of emotions in communications, which is a very, very key topic in this whole process of your becoming a better communicator. So I really appreciate your efforts, Ramya, and thanks to all of you again for being here. A little bit uh, of background on Professor Ranganathan. Uh, as you all probably know, she has, uh, is a visiting professor here at IIM Bangalore and has been teaching organizational behavior and a host of new topics, uh, things that uh, I believe have actually added great value to the curriculum here and to our students as well as to our teachers. As you may be aware, Ramya has dedicated her life to helping people find joy and meaning through their work and in my estimation has touched over 10,000 participants through various innovative programs and courses over the last close to one decade that she's been here at IIM Bangalore. As you will find from this afternoon's session, her style of teaching is unique and effortlessly blends intellectual left brain logic with intuitive right brain reflection. Now, that's a mouthful, but in short, it means you're going to have a great experience and uh, we are all looking forward to it. Uh, Ramya is uh, an electrical, electronics and communication engineer from IIT Madras and holds a, a PGDM or MBA degree from IIM Ahmedabad. As part of her understanding of the work-person work relationship, she studied organizational behavior at the London Business School from where she earned both a Master of Research as well as a Doctorate in Management and Organizational Behavior. She has rich corporate experience in companies such as ICICI, Infosys, and Citibank. That's pretty much enough. I'll now hand you over to Ramya. Once again, Ramya, thank you very much for being with us, and I hope you all have a good session. One small process input is that if you have questions at any time, please put them on the chat participants. I will note them down and probably at the end of this session, uh, I will put up the questions uh, to Ramya so that she can try and give you more insight and clarification on what she's talked about. I hope that's okay. So have a lovely session. Thanks and over to you, Ramya. Thank you, Bringi, for that nice and warm introduction. And thank you to all of you participants for joining us on this Friday afternoon. And um, I hope we have some fun together. So um, yeah, so feel free to uh, write any chat, you know, questions that you have as along the way on the chat uh, window, as Professor Bringi said. And uh, we'll keep all the question and answer till the end. But if I spot something which needs an immediate clarification, I might just take it up. Um, right then it's uh, as well okay so uh, when I uh, when the Center for Communication actually asked me to do this webinar I was like hmm well I don't really you know uh, teach communication and I wonder what I'm going to do this webinar about like what's what's it going to what am I going to uh, cover here because my background is really in psychology and uh, what I have been researching and teaching for the last 15 years is really about emotions and how the brain works and bringing that to application in different uh, areas of our life. 
And then I suddenly remembered that I do have a degree in communication. And this took me all the way back to my BTEC, where I was an electronics and communications engineer and took me back to the times when I was burning the midnight oil, you know, doing electronic communication. And I decided to take a card out of that communication and actually use it to design this session. So those of you who are engineers here will probably resonate with what I'm uh, talking about here, but even for um, you know, everyone else. So if you look at electronics communication, when we look at good communication, we're really looking at three things. We have a device that transmits. So we're looking at the quality of the transmitter. We're looking at the ease and efficiency of the communication channel and we try to minimize resistance in that. And then we have a device, which is the receiver. And we look at the effectiveness of the receiver in terms of how does it take in data and convert it as accurately as possible into the information that it was supposed to be converted into. So let's, we're gonna use this analogy here, okay? And these are the three things that I'm gonna talk about today, except that now, in, in, when we're looking at human communication, we're gonna look at our brains as the transmitter, which actually decides how to express whatever it is that needs to be expressed and the role of emotions in that. And then we're gonna look at the human brain itself as a receiver because we take in data and then our brain actually conjures it and constructs it into information, makes sense of it. And we're look at, going to look at the role that emotions play in that receiving job of the brain. And then we're going to look at the uh, communication channel between two people, right? And we're going to look at how we can leverage emotions and actually decreasing the resistance in this communication channel, how to create an effective communication channel and decrease the resistance in that. So are you game for that? Okay. So, um, so before we get into each of these three steps, I'm going to introduce you to a little bit of uh, biology. Now, <laughs> yeah, we're going to bring all subjects into this, okay? So we're going to look at a little bit about the way our brain is structured. And, uh, and because that will actually help us see the role that emotions play in our thinking and choosing and all of that. And when I say our, I mean our brains. So one of the things that uh, I always do is I tend to distinguish between people and their brain. So you'll see me using phrases like me and my brain or you and your brain, the listener and his brain. So just bear with me for that, okay? Now, um, okay, so if you look at the way the human brain is structured, I'm, uh, so, at the, right at the, so this is the spinal cord and right at the base of the brain, you have a certain part of the brain that psychologists call the reptilian brain. So there's another nickname for it. It's also called the lizard brain. So you might have heard about it, the lizard brain in popular uh, press. So what this is, is it's just a very primitive part of the brain. And then the other parts, more evolved parts of the brain have developed around this region. So this primitive part of the brain is called primitive. It's called reptilian or lizard because it's actually very similar to the brains that reptiles had, have even now, okay? And a good way to understand the functions and the limitations and capabilities of this part of the brain, the reptilian brain or the lizard brain, is actually to, a shortcut to understand that is to just look at uh, the reptiles. So I want you to look at, think of crocodiles, lizards, snakes, okay? And uh, do these animals make decisions? Yeah. What kind of decisions? So they make these black and white decisions. Do I go? Do I not? Do I eat? Do I not? Do I fight? Do I not? Do I run away? Do I attack? Right? So yes and no kind of decisions. What do we call black and white decisions? Not very strategic, not very complex, not with, you know, a hundred uh, data points in it. It's just a yes, no rudimentary black and white thinking. And that's what our reptilian brain also does. That's its capability. That's what it is designed to do. Now, again, if you look at what are the emotions that are, you know, sort of uh, being processed in the reptilian brain, again, take a look at the reptiles by themselves. So what kind of emotions do these reptiles express or experience? So think of crocodiles, lizards, so fear, yeah, 
very basic primitive emotions like fear and aggression. So the equivalent of aggression in human beings is anger and sometimes an intense sense of drive. So these are the basic primitive emotions and these, are, these emotions are processed in our reptilian brain as well, our primitive brain. Now, the way, um, the way our brain, is, the, the way the hierarchy of the brain is structured is that whenever any new information enters the brain, it first, so this reptilian brain or this primitive part of the brain actually works like a gatekeeper. So all information first goes to this primitive part, the lizard brain, which is going to scan it, which is going to check, okay, is, the, is there a threat? So is there a need for threat or is there a need for anger or aggression, which is basically means you need to stand up because you're being, your rights are being violated at some level. So these are the primary questions asked. And if the answer to either of these is a yes, guess what happens? The reptilian brain comes under control. The lizard brain takes over and says, I'm in control here. And the processing of that data or information is actually going to happen at the, by the reptilian brain. So when you take a decision, it's going to be a black and white, yes, no. Is it going to be judgmental? Absolutely. That's what we call judgmental thinking. So those are the kind, that's the way in which the reptilian brain is going to process that information. And that's what's going to be the one in control. That's going to, if you express yourself at that point in time, you'll have the capabilities, pretty much a very primary capabilities, like what is there in your reptilian brain. If you want to have access to your evolved brain, the rest of your brain, then pretty much the answer to these questions, is, it a, is there fear, is there anger, it has to be a no, and then the command goes up and the rest of your brain can then step in and analyze the situation and take a hold and do all the cognitive thinking that you otherwise are, can do as an intelligent person. So keep this basic structure of the brain in mind and let's look at step one which is transmission, okay? So, so, so when you're looking at transmission, now this is really the easiest step. You would think, well, it's very simple. Like, you know, uh, in electronics, it's like, well, you have some information. There is something you want to convey it and you translate it into signals, right? Data bytes or something and you get it across. So as human beings, what do we do? We have an idea, we have a thought, we have something and we sort of want to say it. Now, here's the thing. When we say we, are in a situation and what we really mean is our brain. So if you're in a situation where your reptilian brain is under control because you're either afraid or you're angry, then guess what? The, the way you express that is going to be a very reptilian way, a very basic black and white judgmental way. So has it ever happened to you that you've been upset or you've had a fight or you know, you've got into an argument with someone and you had this heated exchange and you screamed and you lashed out. And then later you came back home and let's say after you had cooled down and had a cup of tea and chatted with friends and you'd got over it and you thought about it and you're wondering, hmm, why did I say that? What made me say it that way? Like, I'm not a mean person. I behave like a monster. Why did I behave like a monster? Well, you weren't a monster and we've all been there done that we aren't monsters but in that moment when you were expressing your monster brain or your reptilian brain was the one that was dominant and that was the resources that your brain had access to and that's why you expressed it that way okay um okay so <laughs> yeah i see some very interesting questions we will take these up at the end okay <laughs> so i'll just read it out though someone says our brains haven't had an upgrade in the last in several years yeah frankly it's like it's upgrading very slowly we are upgrading our ways of living much faster than our brains and in fact uh, you know what uh, our brains were designed actually in the, in the spirit of this question, to help us survive in the caveman's time. So if you look at the reptilian brain, if you've heard of the stress response, the fight or flight response, that is actually the response to perceived threat when your reptilian brain comes under control. And that's your stress response. Uh, doesn't work very well in the modern age and day, but that would be another topic to go into. Okay, so let's stay with the transmission. And now I'll go to the step two, which is, the receiver, the receiving of information. 
So now keep the basic structure of the brain that I've talked about again in mind. And let's look at the brain as a receiver. Now, uh, okay. So here I'm going to introduce a little more theory, okay? And uh, this is a theory of sense making of the brain. So just keep thinking of your brain as a receiver, okay? Uh, an instrument that takes data in from the outside world and then processes it to make sense of it. Okay, so there are two steps in this. One is taking data in. There's a lot of data available in the environment. The brain has to select and take some of it in. Uh, what, what would happen if the brain takes in all the data that is there in our environment at any point in time? It would go into overwhelm, right? So, uh, very, and we call this bounded awareness in psychology, actually, but you don't need a fancy term. Just think of it in terms of your own everyday experiences. If you're sitting in a classroom or a discussion, there are 10 of you there. There's a lot that's been said and heard. Each one of you comes out and somebody interviews each person. What did you hear? What did you understand? It's going to be different for each person. You, each one of you has taken in a set of that information, right? Using some parameters, your brain has decided this is relevant for me, this is not relevant for me, and your brain has selected a subset, right? So the brain is always selecting a subset of information. That's one step. Uh, we call that selection. And then the brain is also now processing it and interpreting it. And again, there is a huge degree of subjectivity involved here because remember, uh, the same data can be uh, made sense of in different ways. So again, in psychology, sometimes, uh, you know, there's this phrase, which I love, which is the facts and stories. So there are facts, and then we create narratives and stories about that in our head. Again, you know, if you take very simple examples, you're sort of, uh, um, okay, let's say there are six of you and you see a scene, and let's say maybe it's an accident scene, someone's fallen on the ground, someone else is standing, and each person interprets that scene in their own ways. We give this as assignment questions, write an essay on this picture or write something, right? So each of our brains is interpreting the same data in a different way. And this depends on our past conditioning, our experiences, our way of looking at the problem, and all of that, we call this mental models. So I want you to appreciate at this stage that there is an objective reality, or something can happen, from that, our brain selects a subset of information. And then in a way that's very unique to ourselves, the brain interprets that information. And that becomes our reality, what we, the way we make sense of what is being said to us or shown to us. Now, now this is subjective. So, so you, I think some of you would have automatically got that for any objective reality, actually, you have infinite possible subjective realities. Today, I'm going to talk, however, about how our emotional state actually influences the kind of narrative or story that we make and the kind of selection that we do of the information. Yeah. So, so we're just going to look at the role of emotions here, okay, in this act of sense making. So, again, uh, let's, let's take an example of. Uh, you know, uh, let's go back to the caveman's time, actually, okay? Because as somebody rightly mentioned in the chat, yes, this brain was designed for the caveman's time in many ways. So let's say you're walking in a jungle and you see some, you know, something sort of shaking a bush and an orangish tail. It could be a tiger or something scary. And if your main brain were to start analyzing the situation, you would be at a great risk. But luckily, fortunately for us, that doesn't happen because of the way our brain has been wired. So our reptilian, the data enters the reptilian brain. Reptilian brain says, oh, could be a tiger. Possible threat gets into a black and white decision. Let's fight or let's run. Let's take an example where it's decided to run away and it runs away. This is danger and, and it makes you run away. Okay, this is the classic stress response, creates a lot of changes in our body, but we're just going to look at this information processing changes that happens. So two things happen, for, uh, happen during this stress response when this primitive brain comes under control. One is that this, remember the bounded awareness that I told you about, the fact that we can't see everything in our environment and we, if it, we just focus on what's relevant. This lens of awareness becomes even more narrow. 
in the stress response. So under fear or anger situation becomes even more narrow. Why is that? Because you're running away from the strike and you want to really focus on that, okay? Uh, there's a second change that happens and this, is, this change is happening at the level of interpretation. So your brain actually starts interpreting data differently. So let me give, uh, extend this example a little more. You're running away from the tiger or the possible tiger, okay? And because your attention is very narrow, you're just looking at the path you're running on and tiger, you're not, that's not the time when you're going to look at all the positive side of life, the rainbow, the birds, the meadows. They don't exist in your world. All the brighter things, all the good things, they don't exist. It's just the tiger. You're just running from it and that served to help you, okay? So it's a very narrow attention. And you see in your path along the side, another bush that's sort of shaking, just neutral and there's nothing else. It's a neutral piece of data. Normally on a day when you're feeling glad and when your heart is singing and you're looking at the rainbows and the birds and the rabbits and a bush shakes, you might think, oh, I'm curious. I wonder maybe there's a rabbit behind it. Maybe, you know, let's see, maybe there are butterflies here. But in this state, when you're already running away from a possible tiger and this bush shakes, your brain, how do you think your brain is going to interpret this other bush shaking? Another threat, another tiger. And you avoid that in your escape. And this is also part of the evolutionary response to keep you safe. How does this play out in real life? Okay, let's say, let's look at a personality trait, for example, of our propensity to trust people or to give them the benefit of doubt or to look at the brighter side of things, okay? And this might be our normal way of looking at things. But when we are under the stressed mode or when we are under fear or anger, we actually change. So when somebody says something to us, our brain will interpret that also as a threat, that also as an attack, that also as something for us to defend ourselves against. And that's the narrative that we will tell ourselves. Now, you know, <clears throat> A science, this might seem like, yeah, very obvious and very intuitive, but this hits us and influences us at a day-to-day -day level in some very profound ways, okay? And ways that we may not even realize. So I'm gonna share with you a personal example here, actually. So, um, okay, so this is a real incident that happened to me and this was like about three, four years when I was early in my career, I had joined IM Bangalore as a faculty. And at that time, I had, uh, you know, sent out a proposal for certain things I wanted to do, certain changes in a course and all of that. And uh, I'd sent it to the dean. And one morning I was at office and I, then I opened my emails and I saw this reply and the dean was like, no, we can't do this because of this. So, you know, we can't do this, this, this. It was a no. And I read the response. And I got really upset and I got really hurt. And I thought it was, it was an attempt to stifle me and an attempt to put me down and an attack. And I was really, I, you know, and I started crying and I was very, very upset about it. And that's how I read it. So fortunately that day, a colleague of mine actually walked in and she said, hey, can we go to have tea? And she found me all upset and crying. And she was like, what happened? And I told her, you know, this is what happened and I've never understood and I'm being attacked and not being allowed to do this. And once again, I've been shot down, blah, 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 blah. And she heard me out, we chatted, we had tea. Once I was feeling better, very gently she asked me, she said, Ramya, can I see the email? And I trusted her, she was a close friend and by now I was, also in a nice mood, my reptilian brain had given back control to the rest of my brain. The higher processing capabilities were back. And I said, yeah. So she read the mail. And then she said, you know, Ramya, um, and very gently, you know, she said, she didn't make me wrong, but she was like, I don't know why you were so upset. I don't think he was attacking you. I don't think it was personal. I don't think anyone was putting you down. He's just saying you, you can't do it for these reasons. And I was like, really? <laughs> so I went back with her and we read the email together. And this time I realized, yeah, it was just, I had made a request for X, Y, Z. And the reply was, it cannot be done because of ABC. Now that is as close as it gets in this case to the objective reality, the words on the email. And I was lucky that I had this opportunity to go back and read it. 
And then I realized that morning, I had already been stressed about something earlier in the morning. There was an issue with a school bus and sort of did all of that. And when I landed up in office, I was already stressed, which means my reptilian brain was already in control. And then I opened my mailbox and I saw this email. And my reptilian brain actually interpreted this email as an attack. And I had got all my defenses out and then I got upset also, right, without being able to actually process that information. Now, in every, I was very lucky that I could go back and see the objective reality here, the email. Now, what if it had been a conversation instead of an email? Could I actually have gone back and ever remembered what was actually said? No, because my brain only has access to the way it has interpreted it. My brain in the conversation, in the live conversation, my brain would have selected parts of what was being told to me, the parts it thought was relevant, and it would have interpreted that and made that into a story. And as far as I'm concerned, that is reality. Yes, it's a subjective reality, but that is the only reality I have access to. That is my truth. That's what was told to me. That was what was done to me. <laughs> Are you getting what I'm saying? I don't, in, in, unless it's email or something, you know, you don't get a chance to go back and actually check. So it was an eye-opening moment for me. And, and I think uh, this is true for all of us. We are walking through our lives, creating our subjective realities. Uh, this depends on a whole lot of things like beliefs and mental models, but also definitely our emotions. And so if we insist that this is the truth, we better wait a bit about it, okay? And uh, here's the chicken and egg story that comes when it comes to sense making and emotions. I'm just having a look at the time, yeah. So we're gonna end at 3.45 to take questions. But so if we look at this chicken and egg story of sense making and emotions, you see that we live in real time. It's not just one incident, right? Our, our emotions, like I told you, influence our sense making as the receiver. And then our sense making actually influences our emotions. And then we become the transmitter also, especially in a conversation. It goes on, right? Let me give you an example of how our sense making actually influences our emotions. Because remember, I told you under fear and anger, our lens becomes very narrow. And you, you'll see the repercussions of that, okay? So let me give you a classic uh, question. Let me ask you, just imagine this. Imagine that there's a window and outside the window, you see uh, a boy of around 12 years old mercilessly beating a dog. How would you feel? Just touch base with whatever emotion you're feeling now, okay? So when I ask this in classes, most people feel angry, some feel outraged, some feel really bad for the dog, whatever it is, right? That's what you're feeling. Now, there were actually two windows, many windows in that room, and one window was open. So you open the other window so you can see a bigger part of the scene. So I open the second window, and you see that there's a three-year-old three girl, little girl, lying on the ground with a dog bite, screaming in pain. So the dog has just bit her and the boy is defending her from the dog. Now, what emotion are you feeling? How are you making sense of the situation now? Can you see? So it's again, very different. People feel compassion. Oh, what a hero he is. Yeah. So, so really this thing. So the subjective reality, the reality that we create in our heads is the one that creates emotions also. There are a whole lot of other things that create emotions, but just to let you know that our sense making also acts as a trigger for our emotions. And then based on the emotions, the lens itself changes, right? So you can see less. There might be other things in the periphery that your brain is not actually seeing because it's narrowed its lens. Okay, so that's about the receiving part of the brain. Now, let me, <clears throat> let me talk a little about this thing that we call the communication channel, okay? So, yeah, in electronics, we look at, well, I did my BTEC project in optical fiber, so I was a huge fan of fiber optics back then it was coming. And, or you could look at, you know, different things. But one of the things that we look at in terms of the channel is we see how much resistance is there and, or how easily is that data flowing. Okay, so let's look at this, the channel of communication that we create between the speaker and the listener or two people when we're having a conversation or a speaker and the audience, teacher and student, parent to child, whoever it is, right? 
Okay. And uh, for this, I'm going to actually tell you a story. Okay. So I'm going to give paint two little scenarios for you and ask you to compare the communication channel and compare what's happening in both these situations. Okay. So scenario one, scenario one, I want you to imagine that you're a parent, you're a parent of, let's say a kid who's five years old, five or six, and you decide that, and you like to teach your child. And so you have a lesson plan, you have a curriculum, you've created a very fancy lesson plan where you want to teach your kid in the evenings. And today is the day you're teaching geography. And you've decided to cover the Amazon rainforest. So you take out clips from the BBC documents, from internet, you bring out little toys, pictures, the encyclopedia, the globe, and you know, you make it really nice. Uh, uh, audio video, uh, visual presentations and you sit the child down and say okay listen today we're going i'm going to tell you about the amazon rainforest and it's this beautiful place and there are these you know creatures and there are these rivers and mountains and you teach the child for one hour that's scenario one scenario two okay is um scenario two is that the same five-year-old or six-year-old kid is actually playing in the playground and the kid overhears some of the other children speaking about the anaconda snake. And uh, the kid is sort of like, wow. And, you know, he hears bits and pieces, but he doesn't really understand. And he comes back and asks you, mama, is it true? There's this big anna something snake. It can eat human beings. And Amazon delivers it. Because, you know, as far as your kid knows, Amazon delivers books and toys and the other things that we shop online. <laughs> so this big snake, those kids were fibbing, right? They're making up like kids always. They always make up things. And then you call your kid and say, no, actually, maybe they're not really making up, you know? There's more to this. Amazon isn't just that company. There's actually a place called Amazon. Come, let me tell you about it. And then you take out the globe, you take out some maps, you talk about the Amazon rainforest, you show the anaconda snake, and then you talk about the other animals, the climate, the geography, and you have that one hour lesson about the Amazon rainforest and the animals there, including the anaconda. So I want you to compare both of these. Okay. So in which one is there more ease in terms of the communication and less resistance from the child in terms of receiving? So again, when I ask this in classes, it's, yeah, everyone says it's the second one. And when I probe them and say, what is it about the second one? Where did that ease come from? You know what? It came from this idea of push versus pull, curiosity. The child was curious, but the child had the initial question. The way the communication channel changes, and I call this the physics of communication, which is there you see my engineer brain again. In the first case, the communication was all about push, push, push. It was very well intentioned. I'm a caring, loving parent. I want my child to learn. I found out the best things, all of that, very well intentioned, but I'm pushing it. I have decided that you need to know this now, and this is good for you, and this is important, and I'm pushing it on to you. Now, let me ask you, when any salesman or anybody comes and come, pushes something at you, what's your first response? What do you feel like? You want to protect yourself and leave me alone. Yeah, you put your barriers and defenses up and you just sort of protect yourself. And that can happen in communication also when you're trying to push something onto someone. And be something, I know we have to do it. As professors, we often do that. <laughs> yeah, and we feel that resistance of when we're pushing something onto someone. The second case was all about the pull. The kid was pulling. Mama, I want to know, what is this Amazon? What is this Anna thing? It's pulling. The child is like pulling things out of you. And there's no resistance there. Now, in real life, in our situations, can we always have a pull? Probably not. But we can get closer if we understand the differences and we realize that there's so much less resistance and pull compared to push. We can simulate it sometimes and that's where emotions come in. So the emotion that we can use to simulate a pull, and I often do this in classes, in fact, all the time, is curiosity. By the way, curiosity has been elevated to the status of emotions recently in psychology. It wasn't always called an emotion, but after studying the brain and neuroscience and all of that, curiosity is now an emotion, technically, right? So if you can instill curiosity, you can actually get it into a pool and you can keep the channel of communication open. Yeah? 
Okay, so this is a, uh, another example of where you can use emotions to actually clear out that channel. Okay, so we talked about transmitting, the channel clearing, and receiving. And uh, <clears throat> finally, now I want to talk about uh, one mega tool that we all have when it comes to emotions, okay? You can think of it as a tool, we often don't, but this is called mirror neurons. Okay, so um, what are mirror, mirror neurons? Mirror neurons are neurons that all of us have in our brain, a set of neurons that are dedicated to mimicking and sort of imitating patterns from other people's brains. Okay, <laughs> so that's their job. Okay, how, uh, let me tell you how mirror neurons were um, discovered because, you know, it's a fascinating story and just very quickly you can get it into your app, own application. So mirror neurons were first discovered in a lab in Italy when uh, scientists were doing some experiments on a monkey. So they had the monkey all wired up and they took a break and they were actually mapping the motor movements of the monkey. So how they typically do this in neurosciences, they'll make the monkey do something and then they'll say, which part of the brain is being used for that, right? So they have, and then they took this break and then somebody called the professor back and said, you know what, there's something weird going on. Maybe we've made a mistake in our wiring because the screen that the monkey's brain was wired onto was actually showing that the monkey should be moving its hands or legs, but the monkey was not doing that. So they said, they checked everything, it seemed right, and they said, let's look at what the monkey is actually doing. The monkey was staring outside at someone who was eating an ice cream, and he was moving his hands. And, so, and the monkey's brain was actually getting fired up with the monkey's brain when the monkey should have been moving its hands. So this led to a flurry of research on well, not just monkeys, but human beings. So typical ex uh, experiments would be like, let's call, say they call me and another person into the lab, they show this other person a horror movie and they check that this, they check this person's brain to make sure that he is feeling scared enough. I get to observe this person. I have no access to the audio or video of the movie. I'm just looking at this person while he is looking at the horror movie. And then they scan my brain and they detect the fear patterns in my brain. That's mirror neurons. Now this explains a lot, right? So for, for a long time in psychology, there's been this phrase that emotions are contagious. We didn't know why or how they're contagious. So now you know at least one mechanism. So this explains things like, you know, when you go to the movie and you're watching someone on screen and they're crying and you're doing that. Or spectator sports, they are playing cricket, right? They're batting, bowling, and you're having all that adrenaline rush <laughs> sitting on a sofa. Or riots where everyone is angry and half the people, they don't know why they're angry, but they're just angry, okay? Or rock concerts where there's this heightened sense of euphoria. And this is really resonance. And this is mirror neurons plus resonance in large groups, okay? Because if you know physics, again, you have many pendulums at different frequencies. You bring them into a room. Soon they'll all start going at, you know, the, the dominant frequency and they'll be at uh, slightly higher, in fact, higher amplitude. So that's, so this, so what you see in riots and rock concerts and even maybe cricket stadiums is mirror neurons plus resonance. But let's look at what these mirror neurons are doing. Or, you know, why did I say that's a tool that we can use in communication? Well, mirror neurons are both good news and bad news, as you can see, because there's one thing that we are picking up other people's emotions and thoughts, but we'll stay with emotions here and we are getting attuned to it. The good news is that we can influence the others. So when you are in a conversation, so Daniel Goldman, the father of uh, emotional intelligence in um, organizational behavior, calls mirror neurons the secret weapon of leaders. So those of you aspiring towards leadership here, why is that? Because when a leader enters the room, he or she gets everyone's attention. By the way, mirror neurons work when people give you your attention, right? When you're watching the TV screen or you're watching, the monkey's watching the person outside. So everyone looks at the leader. So the leader's emotions, if the leader works on his or her emotions, it just ripples out to everyone else, okay? I picked up even faster. But even on a one-to-one -one conversation, when you, uh, if the other person that you're talking with is angry or agitated or upset, and you start finding yourself mimicking that and getting into that zone, that's very natural. But when you can recognize that it's not your anger, but that other person's anger that you're mimicking, guess what you can do? You can actually pause, take a step back. And if you regulate your emotion, 
hope that the other person actually <laughs> starts tuning into yours. And even if he doesn't, at least you've not got into the trap of, you know, you're angry and I'm angry and you're operating from your reptilian brain and I'm operating from my reptilian brain and you're hearing a small part of what I said and interpreting that. Remember how we, our brain interprets things from the reptilian brain as a threat and attack and all of that. And then I hear what you say and I get that as a threat and attack and I try to defend and then this conversation actually goes nowhere. So that is something that we can use again to snap out of these and to actually bring more ease into our communications and more efficiency actually, right? So um, yeah, I think I see quite a few questions. So I'll stop now and I think we've got a lot of, uh, we've talked about the basic aspects and let's just uh, dig into the questions. So Professor Bringy, shall we, is this a good time to take questions? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Ramya. I completely lost track of time listening to your most emotion-filled uh, explanation of how and why we react in uh, situations relating to communication. We have some very interesting questions. Uh, Raj has raised a question that says, what questions would you ask to figure out a person's deepest fears and desires, especially with a stranger, or even worse, with a supervisor who does not like you. I <laughs> <laughs> yes. go about trying to get a feel on what this person's emotional set is at that moment. Nice, okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Raj, for that question. So, um, well, the first thing, there isn't a magic pill solution here. So we've, we've got an understanding of how the brain works. And uh, here are some questions that I would suggest first is, especially if, uh, let's take the stranger first and the supervisor next, because they would be slightly different. <laughs> <laughs> At least my approach to using these tools in these two situations would be different, right? So um, with a stranger, I would first go with the channel because there isn't a channel that's established between you and the stranger. You first need to have that communication channel in place, right? Uh, because if the stranger doesn't know you, the stranger's brain is already pre, you know, pre-geared to sort of look at you with suspicion, right? Like, what do we teach our children? Don't trust strangers. So you're already, you're starting on a back foot. So your first step might be to establish that connection, that trust, don't start with questions about your deepest fears and insecurities. Why will the stranger tell you that? The stranger is like, no way, I'm not telling you anything. So start with a communication channel and then uh, go with questions. And again, I don't know what your intention here is in knowing, getting the, you know, getting to know the deepest fears of the stranger, but approach it reasonably. He's not going to open up and tell it all to you. Maybe you can start with vulnerability. If there is a need for that, maybe you're a therapist or a counselor or something, you share your own, some of your own fears in the context of that, not just out of the blue. So then the other person opens up and is willing to share as well, right? So that would be with the stranger. With the supervisor, I'm guessing there's something else. Again, remember, you go with a direct question to your supervisor. What are your deepest fears? Mm -hmm. Uh, I would, in fact, ask you, why would you want to know that, right? So uh, maybe as a first step, you, you, you sort of, uh, so Raj, are you here online? Do you want to clarify a little more maybe on why would you, because I, you know, rather than, I wouldn't ask my supervisor or anyone about just to tell me their deepest fears. There's some context here that you're coming from. Is that right? Great. Thank you, Ramya. Uh, there's another very interesting set of questions that relate to public speaking and the fear thereof. And the question is, does the reptilian brain actually trigger this whole fear of public speaking? And how do we deal with it? Is yeah. there something you can tell us? Yes, absolutely. Especially because <laughs> this is something I've worked on a lot for myself as well. So, by the way, public speaking fear is a very, very, very common fear, just to let you know. 
it's probably one of the most common fears that a lot of people have. And there are a couple of things that you can do here. Yes, any fear triggers the reptilian brain. And in this case, by the way, when our uh, the fight or flight response, the fear response was, was set up for things like tiger, but it's the same stress mode that we get into, even if it is fear of being laughed at or fear of losing our face or will, you know, other, what will they think of me, all of that. So we have the same response. So yes, your reptilian brain is coming into, uh, uh, you know, control as soon as you get uh, afraid. Now we haven't in this uh, webinar, we just looked at the effect of uh, emotions on uh, communication. We didn't look at a way to manage those emotions, but, uh, I have actually um, a series of videos on the IMB Kite channel on managing stress. So those of you who want to manage fear, managing stress, managing fear and managing stress are very similar, by the way, because stress is triggered by fear. So there are some lovely modalities there. Things, some, uh, you can do things like working on the body, deep breathing, yeah, is one that I, in the interest of time, I just give you that. So. So when you do that, you snap out of, or you know, if you've seen the movie, uh, Three Idiots Like Amir Khan says, all is well, you really have to convince your brain that no, this is not a life or death situation. And then your reptilian brain eases and you can process it from your more rational sense. But you have to soothe it at a very primitive way. And that's why things like deep breathing or any of the other stress management techniques can work. Now, there's one more thing that I want to tell you about public speaking is, remember mirror neurons where our brain mimics <laughs> other people's fears? How many people in your audience are actually thinking of how they would feel if they were up there and talking to you? And how many of them are afraid of addressing the audience? And how much of that are you picking up? So when you are in crowded situations, when you are in, in the spotlight, your fears might just be your brain mimicking, giving you awareness of other people's fears. So wonderful question to ask yourself. You don't have to verbally ask it, just internally ask yourself. When you stand up on stage and you feel that fear is, is this, uh, whose is this? Is this really mine? Or am I just aware of the fear that so many people and the self-consciousness that so many people in this auditorium are feeling in this moment? Third thing that can really help you in public speaking when you get onto the stage. Now, our body and therefore our brains confuse fear and excitement very easily. They're different. Fear and excitement are not the same. They're very different. But we misidentify them. Many of us misidentify them right from early childhood. For example, you know, um, as a kid, you might have been really excited about something. I'm going on travel or I'm going on this giant wheel war war and, a, and an adult or somebody tells you, don't be afraid, it's okay. Because you know, even when you're excited, your heart beats and your pulse races and you're like, whoa. And you're like, oh, this is fear. So for many of us in our brains, fear and excitement is like sort of very, uh, <laughs> you know, intertwined. And this is because of what we've heard and been told. So good question to ask yourself when you're on stage, standing there, facing that audience, is this fear or is this excitement? What if you find out this is just the excitement of being in the spotlight and being right in front of so many people and excitement is not going to limit you, it's just going to empower you, okay? Great, thank you. Ramya, uh, Professor Payal Mehra asked an interesting question, which says the barriers to communication are they initiated primarily because of the reptilian brain or could it be a combination of both that as well as the cortical uh, part of our brain, the cortex? Oh yeah, um, so the barriers come from many places when the barrier is related to safety. For example, for Raj's question, like when I said it's a stranger, I don't want to quickly start talking to you because I want to be safe. That's if it's a safety agenda, it's coming from the reptilian brain. If it's a barrier that is, you know, in psychology, we have this thing of in group, out group. You're in, I'm, this is my team. That's another team. It's like my country, another country, my organization, another organization. 
and that sense of herd mentality or I feel nice and I'm open to people in my group but not in another, that's not coming from a sense of safety but the sense of belonging. That's actually coming from the mammalian brain. So in today's webinar, I only focused on the reptilian brain because we have like 40 minutes and I wanted to give examples but we have other parts of the brain, right? So that's coming from a more evolved part of the brain, not completely evolved but this part which is saying, I'll be, I'll have less, I'll have my barriers down when it's a person from my family, my race, my organization, my institute. But if it's someone else, you know, there's a different thing. So again, your barriers can come from many places. And uh, Great. Thank you. Uh, Suman asked a question. And this is really going to push you to the limit, Ramya. It says, what explains viral behavior what makes communication go viral? <laughs> it's an emotional piece, isn't it? Yeah. Hardly logical. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a hard I, one. It's a hard one. And I'm just going to take my guesses here, like the way my, I, the way, what I'm thinking about it right now. So there are a couple of basic human needs that are kicking in here, right? So we all have this need to be, uh, the need to be heard, the need to share, the need to express and this explains a lot why we are on social media the need to be like so we want to share something that others will see and they will share also and then there is this thing that i told you about this need of belonging so if i tell you something and you share that i feel connected to you or connected to the other person so you know if you've seen stialdini's book on influence principle of similarity creates liking and then you ultimately want to feel good about yourself so uh, this whole idea of what is it that we resonate with and then therefore we share in the hope that this will, you know, we sort of, there's a sense of we want to feel connected that, oh my God, we're all feeling that way. So that's one thing that's happening here. Another thing is, I think when it reaches a critical mass, it becomes like the whole resonance effect, just like the riots or the or cricket, right? Now, cricket is not viral on social media, but cricket is viral as uh, sports, as supposed to, I don't know, football or something else in India, right? Why it just reached that critical mass, and, there's, and I'm not a cricket fan, but I can see it happening. Why cricket and why not something else? You don't have a reason for it other than the fact that this one thing has reached that critical mass, and so there's so much resonance around it that all the brains are picking them up as mirror neurons and getting attuned to it even quicker. So if you've heard of the hundredth monkey effect, I don't know, but it's another psychological phenomenon for another day <laughs> because we'll take more questions. But you can look it up. You can look it up, right? Just look up the hundredth monkey effect. That's something similar. Great. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, the, the other question, which is very, very important and has been asked is, how do we evoke curiosity? Or how do we motivate people who want to listen to us? That's that's something that I guess at least three or four people have asked this question in different ways. But yeah. the question is how do I motivate yes. and enable communication? Yeah. So thank you for asking that. So that's been the story of my life for the last 10 years. <laughs> and story of my life for the last 12 years in parenting. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so curiosity by its nature, uh, it's something that emerges in the individual. Uh, but we can create circumstances to increase that, right? So, for example, I give, and I find the classroom easier here than, like, let's say, in parenting to evoke curiosity because at the start of a session or something, you can actually make people do an exercise, have a small group discussion, and sort of have lead in questions, but make them actively engage in it and then come up with their own, oh, if this is so, what else is this? And I wonder what it is, right? So, so you, you can't feed all the questions, but you can start, you do want to start with questions because again, uh, questions don't resist, people don't push back e very easily to questions, right? It's, if it's a sincere, genuine question, you can almost harmlessly, and in a classroom, you're expected to question, you can put it across. And eventually you have to get the person's brain to engage with it enough to spark their own questions where and when you spot that spark of curiosity, capitalize on it. So like that Amazon story, the child asked only about the one snake, the Anna snake. But you could capitalize on that and once that channel was established, you can talk about the history, the geography, the other animals, the leaves, because the channel is open. 
you can capitalize on that. So you have to sort of be a little like this cat waiting for the mouse also to see what are they interested in and see those sparks and feed that curiosity. It's, there's no magic uh, other than that that I know of at least, but it's possible. And if, if you have a little bit of authority, like in a classroom, as opposed to in the house with your kid, it's easier. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, the, the other uh, question that we've got requests for books and so forth, we can try and tackle that offline. Yeah. Uh, I think that's something we can definitely work. We talked about getting curiosity. The, I, I, so Sudhi asked this very interesting question. I'm not sure how communication oriented it is, but he says, how do we manage dealing with day-to-day -day upsets? What about response versus uh, reaction? These are questions that are coming up. How to manage this? And, and the concept of the reptilian brain gets us to react. Yes. How do we move that to response? Absolutely. Okay, great. So, so, this, uh, so we can have a short answer on this or we can have a three-day workshop on this. <laughs> we'll next, so next the workshops on emotional intelligence are pretty much this. But let me give you some very quick, uh, quick tools, right? So let me give you the two-minute uh, responses. How do we deal with day-to-day -day upsets? Now, uh, my first go-to with day-to-day -day upsets would be, is this mine? Is this my emotion or am I mirroring? the upset of people around me. I would really, really start there, okay? And I'll tell you why I'll start there. Uh, how many of you have, uh, you know, feel really nice when you go to a forest or on a trek to the Himalayas and places like that and you feel really nice? Where, like, you, you know, you don't have seas and oceans of people around you. That's your natural state of tranquility. So a lot of emotions that we are experiencing, even a lot of the thoughts in our brain are not ours. There are mirror neurons at play, so alert and so awake and picking it up. And we are, you know, all of us are so like intellectually obsessed. We've like, so it's, let's say somebody, let's say a gardener outside is sort of, you're looking and he's upset about something or he's angry. And your brain mirror neurons and just picks up a bit of that anger. And then you say, what am I feeling angry about? Oh, maybe I'm feeling angry about the fact that I didn't finish this or that. And we create reasons and we own it. Once we own it, what does it do? It gets into that sense making. Then it actually becomes us. Then we create that, right? So we can't do the quick release. So is this really mine? And if it's a sudden, sudden upset that comes, it often it's not yours. You were just cool and calm and then suddenly something happened. Don't be in a hurry to conclude that it's really an upset to sort of do deep therapy and work around, okay? That's one thing. Uh, the second thing is, uh, remember the reaction versus response that Ringito talked about? Yeah, so when the reptilian brain is under control, again, that's not, it's not a very good idea to at that time talk or do deep therapy on it because it's, it was going to understand it from the reptilian brain's perspective and it's just going to push back. Okay? Nothing's wrong with me. I'm fine. No, like that's what your reptilian brain can do at most. So at that stage, you want to soothe it at a very physical level. So this is like a stress management techniques. You do your deep breathing or you do uh, relaxation, go for a walk, exercise. So physically release yourself because the, uh, because I didn't talk about the body's involvement actually, but our body and emotions and mind are all connected. So when we get into the stress response, for example, our breathing also becomes faster and our heartbeat and there's a whole, logic, whole list of physiological changes that happen because of the stress hormones being released. So if you reverse some of those, this also gets reversed. So you can actually use any of the physically releasing yourself. And when you are in any kind of rational introspection, reflection that you want to do it, do it after you soothe yourself. So don't do it in with your reptilian brain. Great. Thank you very much, Ramya. Uh, we've already taken a lot of your time, and I think uh, we have reached a point where we need to close. So I won't throw any more questions at you at this point. Uh, to all our participants, my suggestion is put your questions down. We'll have it on the chat. And Ms. Anushi, uh, who's our manager of CENCOM, and I will try and get back to you with additional reading or try and understand some of your questions and revert to you.
I yes. hope that's okay. Yeah, and that's okay. And I think some of, some of these, I mean, fortunately, I have uh, quite a few online courses that are, uh, you know, free to watch. So, and some of them will actually address some of these points. So we'll, when we send you the resources, I'll also send you links to that. So you could actually do some, yeah. Get Great. So thank you, Professor Ranganathan, and thank you all. This has been a record webinar and we've had really good questions and we've had people staying and listening. Thanks very much. We'll be back to you with another edition of uh, CENCOM Connect webinars. Have a great weekend and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Go ahead.